sanity to the Clean Water Act so that people understand what does this national water quality legislation cover? That's the question. What does it cover? How far up the watershed does the Clean Water Act go? How many water bodies in the country are actually protected by the nation's premier water quality statute? And yes, I'm talking about headwaters. I'm talking about wetlands. I'm talking about ponds, rills, creeks, streams, swales, prairie potholes, Carolina bays, playa lakes, vernal pools? That's the question, okay? Because whatever happens in Congress is ultimately going back to the Supreme Court. And the five-member controlling block of the Supreme Court is not going to change. It's a bill to clarify congressional intent regarding the geographic scope of the Clean Water Act. And if you know anything about the Clean Water Act, you know that it regulates discharges from point sources. It does not regulate non-point sources. We've had a series of Supreme Court decisions interpreting the geographic scope of the Clean Water Act, which have gotten increasingly worse. We began, actually, on a good note in 1985 with a case called Riverside Bayview, which dealt with a wetland adjacent to a navigable stream that discharged into Lake St. Clair. And the Supreme Court, in a unanimous decision, which is something we rarely see on environmental cases anymore, uh, held that the Corps of Engineers had jurisdiction to require permits for the filling of this wetland adjacent to this navigable creek. And the court famously said it's hard to draw a line. Where does the river begin and where does it end? And where does federal jurisdiction begin and end? And then along came a case called Swank, federalism. The legacy he wanted to leave for his time as chief justice on the court was to retrench federal jurisdiction. And he did it in a series of cases under the Commerce Clause. So Swank comes along and Rehnquist comes along with his opinion, five to four decision, and says that the famous, infamous, abandoned sand and gravel pit in northern Cook County of Illinois that was being targeted for a waste disposal site for all of Chicago's trash. So this pit filled with water and the herons came and made a rookery and then about 121 species actually of birds. And it was called the Migratory Bird Rule, and it wasn't a rule. It was, it was a test that the Corps and EPA used to say, well, if the basis of our jurisdiction under the Clean Water Act is the Commerce Clause of the Constitution, which it is, at least the Commerce Clause, then um, can't we infer that an area that provides significant habitat for migratory birds, which are of significant economic value to the nation, measured in the billions. So here's a quick and easy way for you to determine, is this particular wetland or pond subject to our jurisdiction or not? And the question is, are there ducks there? Well, Rehnquist said that's not enough. So you, Corps, have gone beyond your authority in asserting jurisdiction over this intra-state, non-navigable, isolated pond. Say the Clean Water Act applies to navigable waters. That's the term of art. The term navigable waters is defined as waters of the United States, and the statute stops and does not define the term waters of the United States. If you want to pick out the fatal flaw in the Clean Water Act, that would be it. Congress's failure in 1972 to take the last step 
and define what it meant by waters of the United States led directly almost 30 years later to the decision in Swain. So when you're Rapanos, you're talking about two kinds of wetlands. Wetlands that are adjacent to non-navigable tributaries 20 miles away from anything that would be called a navigable river, okay? Way, way, way up the watershed. Mm -hmm. The other kind of wetland that was involved in Rapanos, which is in the companion case called Carabel, was a wetland in which a berm was in between the wetland and the tributary, okay? So he says when you're talking about fact patterns like that and whether the federal government has authority and jurisdiction over those kinds of remote, small, to him, inconsequential water bodies, he says when you're there, you're at the way far edges of how far Congress can go under the Commerce Clause. Why are you at the way far edges of the Commerce Clause? Because that's the way these five members of the Supreme Court interpret the federalism principle. The federalism principle says there has to be a stopping point to federal jurisdiction. Why? Because if there isn't, you swallow the states. The federal government is a government of what? Enumerated powers. Enumerated powers. Those powers that are enumerated in the Constitution, one of which is the Commerce Clause, which simply says, the federal government has power to regulate commerce what among the isn't, states. What hasn't been specifically given to the federal government is reserved to the states. Margins of Congress's authority. If you start with that assumption, then you say we're not going to defer to the agency's interpretation. We want to see clear evidence that Congress intended to go this far. Now, this, I have to tell you, is disingenuity in the extreme. Because in 1972, there was no limit, no practical functional limit on Congress's authority under the Commerce Clause. There had never been a Supreme Court decision striking down a federal statute under the Commerce Clause. That all came from the Rehnquist Court. So you see the catch-22 they're playing. We are expecting that Congress in 1972 would have anticipated where our jurisprudence limiting Congress's authority under the Commerce Clause was going. And to have articulated in the statute, we intend to assert the full limit of our Commerce Clause authority. Okay? So, it comes down to him saying, I'm going to decide what Congress intended with these this term. I'm not going to pay any attention to the, to the agency's interpretation. I'm not going to give it deference because you're out, the, out there on the, you know, the limits. And now my job is simple. I have to find an objective definition of waters. That's all my job is. I'm not making policy here. <laughs> my job is real simple. What does the word waters mean? And his clerks, God bless them, found it in the 1954 American uh, uh, Webster, whatever, dictionary. And it says, relatively permanent bodies of water such as lakes, rivers, and oceans. I'm done. I'm done here. 30 years. 30 years of agency practice. 30 years of judicial decisions. 30 years of permitting. 30 years of enforcement. 30 years of planning. 30 years of water quality standards. 30 years of regulating hazardous and oil spills. Means nothing. Okay, so you got Swank now. That's the isolated water body case. And you got Riverside Bayview, which is the wetland adjacent to a navigable water, okay? So now we have some brackets. Wetlands adjacent to navigable waters, in, automatically, in. Isolated wetlands, out. Okay, now we come to Rapanos, the gut level question. What about 
not only wetlands adjacent to non-navigable waters, but what about non-navigable waters? Non this is the problem trees. when you start to slice and dice the aquatic ecosystem. It makes no sense. And if your goal is to control the input of pollutants, what does it matter whether it's a ditch or a stream or what used to be a stream is now a ditch or whether the ditch is wholly in the upland or only partially in the upland and whether it has relatively permanent flow or just great big washes of flow where all the shit comes out. What difference does it make on God's earth? You might say. You might say. Sooner rather than later is going to have to confront the question, what are we going to do other than the Clean Water Act to deal with these aquatic ecosystems? Because we're, we're not going to get a whole lot further than than just kind of gaining back ground we've already lost, and it isn't even enough even if we do.